Welcome to Focus Today. Well, uh, Patrick Doyle's in the house from Verica uh, Veritas Counseling. Guess what? We're literally on the couch with Patrick today. <laughs> <laughs> we got rolls of ropes here. I Actually, should be over there. <laughs> you should be sitting here. I should be laying on the couch over there being, you know, psychoanalyzed or something. The problem is if I lay down, I'll go to sleep. Yeah, I would too. You'd have to finish the show. Anyway, welcome to uh, uh, Focus Today with Patrick Doyle. And uh, we're taking on a very interesting topic, uh, reconciliation. You and I have talked about this before, Patrick, yep. because you have said that forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean that the next thing you do is reconcile. Yeah, I, I see. I see them as very separate processes. Okay. Um, obviously, there's interplay, but forgiveness is between the person who's been offended and the offender. No, forgiveness is between the person who's been offended and God. Okay. okay. Reconciliation is the process where we're going to try to take the relationship that's been harmed and put it back together. And what I hear people say a lot of times is, well, you're, you, 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 you should forgive me, which is them saying you should just have a relationship with me and sort of sweep it under the rug. And what happens when we do that, when we don't really go through the process that God's laid out, is that things fester. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then resentment, deep resentment can really start to build, which is going to do what? It's going to harm the relationship. So <clears throat> we, what we want is a quick fix, Perry. We don't want the pain of a reconciliation, which is me actually having to go through the process where I'm rebuilding trust with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, trust is not something you are granted, it's something you earn. And trust is earned through trustworthy behavior. Hmm. So people always wanna say, well, I, I, I'm, t I'm different. <laughs> well, I'm suddenly from Missouri. <laughs> The yeah. show me state. You'll have to show me. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yada, yada, yada. I don't care. So, but what I see in the church is that <clears throat> we often want to skip over that. And I think as a result, we have relationships that live with damage mm -hmm. instead of healing. So I see it this way. If, if we have a relationship that gets harmed and then we go through the process of uh, reconciliation, we get to the other side, what we have is actually a deeper, healthier relationship. The wound turns into something that makes a relationship stronger. And so what I see all the time is relationships that have all these unresolved wounds in them. And so people are triggered all the time and they can't, they can't stay focused on a topic. One topic comes up and then four come up. And so it's why I believe it's so important that people understand how to do this because God gave us these principles for a reason because he knew as soon as two people got together, there was going to be a need for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So when people are uh, dealing with the, the, the act of forgiveness, I think they get clouded with it. It means automatically reconciliation. Yes. And the last thing they want to do is talk to anybody. Yeah. Um, so, um, but reconciliation kind of is the finishing act to clean the relationship problem up. But it's not necessarily a requirement. Reconciliation is not a requirement. <clears throat> and that's so... I mean, okay, go ahead. So let, right. let's, let's talk yeah. about, let me just go through the four, the four things I think that needs to be present okay. before you start reconciliation. I think that these four things need to happen before you even consider reconciling with someone. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, forgiveness, on the other hand, is something that you should do regardless between you and God because it takes, we, and we did a show about that last time, so I'd, I'd encourage people to look at that. So... We're talking about reconciliation here. So four things have to happen. Look, the uh, offender, okay, the person who does the harm has to be convicted, number one, convicted by God. Not me, not the police, <laughs> not, you know, not the wife, not the husband, not the kid, not the boss. So um, the scriptures say that godly sorrow leads to repentance, mm -hmm. okay? It also goes on to say that worldly sorrow leads to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, so conviction is a very different thing than I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so conviction uh, brings with it this idea that the offender, without anybody telling him or her, knows what they did in specific terms to you. So here's the deal. I hear this all the time. Well, I apologize. I'm sorry. Well, for what? Mm -hmm. If somebody is apologizing to you in general, that's uh, a good indication it's not legitimate. Because God does not convict me in general. 
<laughs> yeah. He convicts me very specifically. When you spoke harshly to your wife and said X, Y, and Z, you were wrong. Oh, okay. So then I go to my wife and I say, you know, Catherine, honey, I was wrong when I said this, that, and the other. So conviction is specific. It's from God. And it's, it, the whole purpose of it is to own your sin. It's not to smooth out the relationship. That is so powerful. That's step one, because it requires divine intervention. Yes. And if that doesn't take place, is there any hope for reconciliation? No. Okay. So we'll get to I that. Hope, I hope people understand yeah, that one. We'll get to that toward the end, because I want to I really talk about how that works in a practical sense. So conviction comes first. That's number one. And, and the scripture says that, you know, godly sorrow leads to repentance. So number two is repentance. Conviction leads to repentance. I realize I'm wrong. <clears throat> From God's perspective, I'm wrong. And then I repent. I'm like, okay, God, you're right. I'm wrong. So <clears throat> I'll just tell you this, too. I, I don't want to get too far away from conviction before they say this, because one of the <clears throat> things that always accompanies real conviction, godly conviction, is something that the Bible calls contrition. Mm -hmm. Now, Contrition isn't very well understood from what I've experienced um, because people don't really know what it is because we see it so f seldomly. Yeah, because it says uh, it's the broken and contrite heart yes. that God is looking for more than he is sacrifice. It's exactly right. Yeah. So contriteness, one of the ways that I say it for, to help people remember it is contriteness, contriteness equals I have no rights. Hmm. I failed. I'm wrong. And there's, a, there's an element of contriteness also that means, look, I, I am so broken and contrite about what I did, I'm going to show you, I'm going to live in such a way that's so clear that you see my behavior is completely different than what I had participated in that harmed you. My contriteness is revealed in how I behave. I'm so committed, I'm going to show you that I'm changing. So there's an element of contriteness that's, you know, that is behavioral. It's not smooth over. It's I rec I'm taking responsibility for my failure. And I'm going to show you behaviorally that I'm changing. And who is, who is the, own, who's the um, motivator of that? It's not the offended. Mm -hmm. So many times in the church we put the onus on the offended. God never does. In the scriptures, God always puts the onus of responsibility on the offended. I mean, on the on offender. The offender. If and again, you, this comes back to, does the offender recognize he is the offender or she is the offender? If they don't recognize it, uh, the other thing I would encourage... You're, in a, you're in this rotation. Yes, exactly. The other thing I would encourage people to, to, to think about is that <clears throat> I see it all the time. People who are offended try to become the convictor. <laughs> yeah. And you know how much damage that can do to a soul? And with no conclusion or satisfaction. Yeah. So if somebody's yeah. unconvicted and you keep running in there trying to get them to take responsibility, what are they going to do to you? They're going to reject you. Or they're going to hurt you again. Or, mm -hmm. And so you get into this, it just, it just gets really a lot worse. So one of the things I tell people who have been offended is you have to let God deal with them. And this is where boundaries comes in. Okay, that's exactly where I was going to okay. go. And yeah. so, but we, we see that as wrong or bad to put somebody out of our lives. Well, if they're harming you, how is it wrong or bad? Okay, so it also, when we get clear about who's responsible for the offense, it gets, the situation we're in gets very clear all of a sudden. Oh, well, it's, that's their responsibility. This is my responsibility. But most offenders uh, are also interested in putting blame somewhere other than on them. <laughs> so they're blame shifters, they rationalize, they minimize, they justify, they spiritualize. And so if the offended isn't clear, about who's responsible, they get caught up in all that blame shifting. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, again, I, uh, we'll have to take a break here, but when we come back, uh, I w if, if the person who has been offended understands that they are not to be the convictor, that's yes. God's job, yes. then the next step for them is to draw a boundary yes. and say, yes. going to that person <clears throat> or trying to deal with that person is... It's either it's an impasse that I can't solve right. or it's an unsafe place I shouldn't go right. to. So here's the thing that has to happen. Is it in those circumstances where there's an offender who's unaware that they're offended, yeah. that they're an offender, 
the, the, the person who's being harmed has to be willing to put the relationship on the altar. Okay. And if you're not able to do that, you will be controlled by the person who's doing the harm because you can't let it go. Yeah, um, especially if the person who's done the harm, in other words, the offender, yeah. is saying that they were justified in doing what they did. Absolutely, which is why it's important for, as we come back, we'll finish up the other two. You have to understand what's required for reconciliation. And then when you don't see it, then you have to be prepared what to do next, okay. which is about the boundaries, which is, 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 is what is the most loving thing you can do to an offender is give them a boundary. Okay, we're talking about reconciliation. Pretty, pretty complex, <laughs> isn't it? It's, uh, and I don't. Uh, the other, the main thing I want you to get out of this is to get you out from underneath the pressure, of thinking you have to do it right away yes. or you have to do it at all. Yeah. I think there's a part of this equation you yeah. really need to get in your heart. Yeah. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back with Patrick Doyle. Hi, I'm Paulina, and I work at the Deaf TV. Did you know that when you support the Deaf TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community, but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedov.us. Okay, we're back. We're on the couch with Patrick Doyle. Can you believe it? <laughs> Literally. Um, we're talking about reconciliation. This is a huge topic. I've done enough counseling to know I don't have a handle on this. <laughs> so I'm on the couch with you, learning from him. Um, but I wish the, I had a handle on it. Yeah, the, the, the main thing I want you to get through all of this is that I think there is immense pressure that if you're the believer in the argument, if you're yeah. the Christian, that you think you've got to run and reconcile. Yeah. And uh, I don't, I mean, reconciliation is a big part of the salvation message. Yeah. But, that's but don't the, misinterpret yeah. that yeah, yeah. as the reconciliation that should be applied to a situation that may be an impasse. And especially if the person who's done the offending from your perspective yeah. is uh, not repentant. If we don't have that going on, then we have an impasse. That's right. And I think you have to find your boundaries of a safe place and yes, move on. That's right. Now, so we dealt with conviction. Conviction. Okay. That leads and we to dealt repentance. With, it leads to, because re godly um, sorrow. Uh, sorrow leads to repentance. Right? Leads to repentance. Okay, so, but let's talk about repentance for a second because I want people to make sure they understand what that looks like. Yeah. So, um, repentance from a scriptural point of view is not about what you say, it's about what you do, it's about mm -hmm. who you are. It's about, you know, I say this all the time I was a drug addict, God convicted me, and over time, I quit being a drug addict. My behavior changed, you know. I was a porn addict. Over time, God convicted me. Over time, I changed, okay? Because what happened was, because God's conviction, I began to agree with Him. That's not a good thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. Rather than rationalizing, minimizing, justifying, and making a way for me to, myself to do it. Which I've done a thousand times on a million things, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't believe there's any change, actually, you know, soul level change without conviction. So, and repentance is a necessary part of that. And so, if you're with somebody who's offended you uh, and they have no repentance, why would you reconcile with them? Because mm -hmm. if they're not repentant or convicted, guess what? They're not going to stop doing what they were doing. They might change tactics. They might, you know, cover a little better, but they're going to still keep doing it because they are, they're not convinced in any way, shape or form that they're the problem or that they're, they're harmful. And so I see this in the church all the time. We just blow right past any of that and say, you know, because uh, I don't want to make any of many enemies, but uh, the church, I think sometimes, particularly in marriages, has an agenda. And that is? The agenda is keep the marriage together no matter what. Yeah. Even though the somebody, I mean, I just talked to somebody a couple weeks ago. That's, you a, know, that's tough, that's a delicate thing. It is, nine mm -hmm. years, the woman's in this relationship where the guy's physically abusive to her and the children, uh, sexually abusive at times, emotionally abusive, you know, the kids are cowering. You know, it's, it, everybody in the house is scared. Well, they go to church and the pastor says, well, you know, whatever you do, don't, don't leave. 
no matter what happens, don't leave them like, did you not hear that person just say that it's a dangerous environment? How, why not leave? So what that says to me is that God bless the pastor, but his agenda was the marriage, not the people. We got to stop doing that because when we do that, we put other people in harm's way and we, we don't love the offender mm -hmm. because we, we make it possible for them to continue. Mm -hmm. That's not loving. So four things, conviction, repentance, uh, asking, uh, uh, confession is the third thing. So, listen, when somebody offends you and they don't confess, they're not repentant or convicted. So, uh, the other thing Isn't is... Isn't confession specific too? And confession is very specific. This is what I'm talking about. In my family, I, I really work at, at not allowing I'm sorry or I apologize. Because those are blanket statements that have no meaning. That's just a smooth overstatement. What I want to hear is my wife, myself, my children say, hey, you know, I want to confess to you the sin of, or my failure of, and then a specific reality. Okay? Confession of a specific sin, a, a, a specific wrong. When I lied to you about X, Y, or Z, I was wrong. I take responsibility for that. I want to know the fourth thing. Will you forgive me for my harm, my failure against you okay so here's the thing think about being think about being a uh, someone who's been offended and the person who offended you come seeks you out they come to you and say Perry you know I was really convicted the other day that when I did X Y or Z to you I was wrong and I want to know will you forgive me for my sin against you when I did such mm-hmm the, if, what, when that happens to the offender, every single time, they instantly drop a little bit of their wall. As soon as the person that offended them is honest, it starts the process of reconciliation. But without the offender being honest, without being, and I see this all the time, the, people who, the person who's being offended keeps going to the offender, trying to get them to deal with it. <laughs> and or you, change or do something. You yeah. gotta wait yeah. it, until they until they come to that conclusion, it's just you manipulating them to do what you want. You, you're a counselor. Have you, you've seen impasse where you just can't get either side to mm -hmm. own yep. a conviction yep. I, yeah. or repentance right. or, or any of those four procedures. Right. So what do you do when you reach an impasse? <coughs> I mean, they're both wrong, <coughs> and yet they see the other person as the problem and not themselves. Well, that, that's, uh, those are days when I'm just trying to tell people, look, neither one of you are owning anything. And so until somebody gets some conviction, I can tell you what's going to happen. You can tell me what's going to happen. It's, it's pretty obvious. There's not going to be any intimacy. There's not going to be any change. There's not going to be any forgiveness. There's not going to be any transition. Because until somebody owns something, we're stuck. And I've never met two people that were married that, that where both parties didn't have things to confess. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, Conviction leads to repentance. Repentance leads to uh, confession. Now, here's the thing I want to say about confession. It has to be a specific confession. It can't be, I apologize for the last 10 years. That's not a confession. What, what, tell me what sin is in that. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something. It has to be them confessing the specific harm. And you can't, as the offender, feed it to them. <laughs> <laughs> tell me what I did. I mean, I, you know how many times I've heard that, Perry? Tell me what I did. Well, why do I need to tell you what you did? What do I need to do? Well, why do I need to tell you what? I mean, if you're going to own your behavior, at some point, you've got to have some insight, right? But, <clears throat> but it, excuse me, let me just kind of jump on that point. Okay. Um, I've been in situations where the offender just didn't see it. Yeah, absolutely. And so you have to tell them, this is what you did. And then the conviction sets in. Sometimes. Sometimes, not all, but yes. uh, look, uh, sometimes people are just flat blind to their actions. That's true. You can say this hurt me, <clears throat> but don't believe that because you say that means that you're reconciling. Yeah, I understand that. Right. But it could be that the person, the offender is pretty dense. That's true. <laughs> and <laughs> so, but that's something that the person that is with them or in a relationship with them has to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Is that this person is very conviction resistant. 
Yeah. And and if you don't live in that reality, you will get chewed up by it. So, mm-hmm. you know, <clears throat> if someone doesn't experience any conviction, any repentance, they don't ever confess, and they don't ever ask for forgiveness. Now, listen, um, if you're with somebody in a relationship and they never do those things, yeah. you're in an unhealthy relationship. Yeah, you're in trouble. It's just a matter of time. <clears throat> and it, and yeah. particularly if you're in a relationship with someone who claims to be a Christian. Mm-hmm. Right? So, <laughs> I have this discussion a lot, Perry, and this might... You know, might get some emails about this, but <clears throat> when when somebody when somebody tells me they're a Christian, <clears throat> uh, I don't believe them right away because uh, I believe that if you're a Christian, I'll see it. I'll see the behavior. I've known you for a long time. I see the behavior in you. I know that you're a Christian. I can tell by how you handle people. I can tell how you you know love people. I see the evidence of the Spirit in you. I've seen you own a wrong. I've seen you. I've seen all that in you. So, you know, but so many people I I do see, though, we talk about, you know, we got to look at their fruit, Mm -hmm. the fruit of the Spirit, you know, and I tell you this, I don't ever make my decision based on the fruit of the Spirit in that way, because, you know, somebody who's, you know, wanting to look like a Christian can fake all of the fruits of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. You can fake it. Did you hear that? I didn't say that. He said that. <laughs> and I'll give you his personal <laughs> phone number coming up and, a little bit later. But that's so true. You know, I've dealt yeah. with enough. A little friend of mine says, that, consider everything a lie until they prove you different. <laughs> <laughs> There's some truth in that. So particularly, you know, I've worked with a lot of uh, churches and I've seen a lot of people in leadership who have that look like they're Christian. But here's the thing that I want to see. So Jesus said, look, I'm leaving and I'm going to send you the Spirit. And the Spirit's going to have two jobs. Yeah. One is to convict you of sin, right? To let you know what's right, to let you know what's wrong, to let you know what's true, to confirm the truth in you, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. The other is to comfort you. Huh. So what I say is, if I don't see conviction and I don't see comfort, I don't see the Spirit. And if you can have the Spirit, you're not His. So what is it for us to want to win at yeah. any cost? It's pride. Okay. Which I love what C.S. Lewis said. Pride is the ultimate anti-God state of being. Wow. And so this is the thing when I'm unconvictable. It's about me. All right, one other question. Maybe we can deal this on the other side of the break. Okay. Um, sometimes... And you see it. Yeah. I see it in counseling too. But, and I'm not a counselor. Don't call me. Um, <laughs> You've made that disclaimer enough, I think. <laughs> I, I, I still get the emails and the phone call. Um, sometimes the offended has an unreasonable expectation yes. of the offender. Mm-hmm. In other words, no matter what the offender does, let's say the offender becomes totally convicted yeah. and repents and confesses yes. to the offended it wasn't what they were expected, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think in some cases, there's enough pathology in the offended, you know, that that they have enough wounding where they might be a much slower to come to that. But most of the situations I've seen, Perry, when the offender is truly convicted, Mm -hmm. no one has to send the the, uh, offended a memo. They know. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, because they have so much history of harm, they might be really slow to believe it, okay? Which is part of the price that the offender has to pay. Yeah, and by the way, um, I've seen offenders become healed Yes. when they become convicted. That's right. Their life, it's yep. kind of like it's the valve that finally unlocks yep. the mm-hmm. flow of peace. That's exactly right, because you know. here's the thing, until you start dealing with those offenses, they don't go away. Yeah. And if you're an offender, which I've been an offender, I mean, I am every day on some level, you know, my hope... Yeah, his whole phone number is... <laughs> <laughs> my hope is that, is that, you know, God loves me and He's going to take care of me. He's going to help me see my wrong and lead me into something that's good. But if I can never admit I'm wrong, there's a, there's a reason why I can't. And I'd like to talk about that. Let me take a break, because when we come back, we got the conviction, the repentance, the confession, and the forgiveness. Yeah. That now creates the atmosphere of reconciliation. Yes, right. I think as Christians, we're too much in a hurry to get them reconciled. Agreed. And I want you to talk about that. All right. Patrick Doyle's in the house from Veritas Counseling. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. 
Hi, I'm Paula and I work at the Dove TV. Every day we get letters and emails from people who've been encouraged, blessed, and challenged by the programs on the Dove TV. But we couldn't do it without you. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to bring inspiration and hope to our community by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or call us at 541-776-5368. Okay, we're back uh, with Patrick Doyle from Veritas Counseling talking about a subject I'm sure at one level or another or at some time or another impacts your life. Mm -hmm. It's the yep. issue of reconciliation. Yep. <clears throat> Whether it's with a spouse or a friend or whatever, mm -hmm. you're going to be dealing with relationships that require yep. certain things to happen so a reconciliation can take place. Yep. I also want to say very clearly <clears throat> here, Rec reconciliations are not mandatory. Yep. Sometimes you can't be reconciled and you have to set a boundary and move right. on. Yep. And I want to be clear about that because I think Christians are under this incredible pressure, if yeah. not guilt, that's to true. always reconcile. Yeah. Right. And that's not the case. Uh, we're dealing with conviction, repentance, confession, and forgiveness. Yeah. And um, so, where if, do we go from here? If those, things, if, those things don't, if those things don't appear in the relationship, then that's your um, sort of directive to say, okay, that person's unaware, unwilling, in denial, you know, whatever. They're not going to own their, their behavior. So should I at that point continue to be close to them? No, of course right, not. Right. <clears throat> so this is where we've really failed, I think, pretty, histor pretty, pretty significantly historically is that. But let me, let me interrupt, <clears throat> excuse me, let me interrupt something. Okay. Here. As a counselor, you have to make a decision, a, a judgment at that point, mm -hmm. um, because maybe the offender is saying, you know, um, they're the problem too. Uh huh. At what point do you say to somebody, this isn't a safe position for you to be in, you need to come apart? I mean, that is a big thing to say. It is. And so really, it's not about me making a decision, it's about the person who's being a, a harm making that decision. And, but, I guess the, what I'm saying is how do you know that, the, that you're, that what they're saying is true? I mean, you obviously have to weigh both sides. Yeah, and, you do. You have to make a decision. And, and, and I wish it were an exact science. It would, yeah. it would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been right smacked in the middle of those when I'm going, yeah. I don't know if I want to make this decision right. here, but I do think some space is required. Yeah, and so this is, uh, you know, I mean, many times in my life, uh, I've had to put people outside of my life uh, because their unwillingness to own their responsibility, their harm. Um, and, you know, early in my Christian experience, I was told pretty significantly that that wasn't okay. And, I mean, I've even put parts of my family out of my life because they're harmful. And... It, here's the other thing is that I think we also take some of the power away from the offended when we say they don't have a right to choose what harm is. But listen, if I believe it's harmful, that's what matters. So okay. everybody has a different level of sensitivity. One person may be able to handle one thing and another person may not. Okay, so we have to also take into consideration the frame of the person we're dealing with. Um, so, but listen, in a reconciliation, if someone is convicted, repents, you know, confesses and asks for forgiveness, the offender is going to naturally open up mm -hmm. when they see that behavioral change. And like I said before, you have to be from Missouri. Those people have to show you. They can't just tell you. And so if you and, and the other thing that I see all the time, Perry, is that as, as somebody who's been offended, I really want the relationship. I want it to get back together. I don't want the offense to be there. So I kind of deny it myself and I kind of minimize it and I just keep going back into that relationship and getting harmed, okay? And the more you get harmed, the harder your heart's gonna get. And you know, it's my belief that hardness of heart is the one thing, mm. the one thing. Well, that's what God gave Moses. Yeah, was to, that's what will destroy a relationship. Mm -hmm. So how do I maintain softness? Well, in some cases, it's a boundary so that that person can't keep harming me. Okay? Sometimes it's my confession because I'm the offender, right? 
But without humility and brokenness and conviction, I don't think that you're going to have a healthy relationship long term. Okay. Because me, I don't know two people that are in a relationship where somebody's not wrong at, occasionally. All right, let me ask you this question. Is reconciliation conditional? Yes. If the person does not own their responsibility, then reconciliation is not advised. So let's say it's your uh, spouse, okay? So you're in, a, you're in a conflict with your spouse. They won't own it. How do you set a boundary with someone you're living with and in a relationship and have your life completely intertwined with, right? How do you set a boundary with that person that's effective in helping them see that you're not, that's not okay with you and, and, and maintain some sort of family life? Right. And so I've had this conversation many times with people, Perry, where it's, it, they struggle with, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. So let's just say that someone in the relationship is verbally, you know, harsh. It's not abusive, you know, really. But it's just they, they, they're snippy. It's hurtful that, you know, they're maybe they're, uh, you know, unkind with, you know, how their tone. So and it, it hurts you. So what do you do? How long are you going to be able to live with that before you get hard? Mm -hmm. You know, you could die the death of a thousand blows, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Instead of it's not like somebody shooting me. It's like they just keep cutting me, right? So what do you do? How do do you, how do you, and that person doesn't seem to have any idea that they're, they're harming you. And maybe because you're acting like it doesn't hurt, Mm -hmm. right? So it isn't that kind of like an act of love. You just. I say that because I've had people saying, you know, I just put up with it because it's just one of those things. Yeah. And what what that leads to is distance. That leads to a broken relationship because if someone's harming you, if they do care about you, don't you think they'd want to know? Good point. Right? So, but in many relationships, the person that's being offended knows the other person doesn't care, which is why they, they rationalize it. Mm. And then they're too afraid to bring it up because they don't want to make it worse. How do you bring it up? So here's the deal. So I think if you're in a relationship where it's a sensitive subject or the person is reactive, I prefer having some of those discussions in writing. And the reason why is usually in a relationship like this, those, some of those issues have been brought up multiple times and they have the same bad result. (laughs) It's what I call a looping argument. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing over and over again. And you never get to a good place. So you start to get defeated about it like, it's not going to work. It doesn't matter. So one of the things I would do is that the person who feels offended needs to sit down and write what they're experiencing, what they feel, what their opinions are, and just get it out. Okay? And then put it away. A couple days later, come back and look at it and be like, okay, is that all still true? Is that really how I felt? Because when you do it in the moment, mm. you get out the intensity and then you come back and you're like, okay, that's a little too much jalapeno. I might want to take that out. <laughs> you know, you know? <laughs> so you, you can sort of, when you write, there's not all that reactivity. When you write, you're not in the presence of the person that has an impact on you. Yeah, and I've always said, you, you got to take the response that you've been building up in your mind. you yeah. got to get it out of there because if not, you will go to that spot and it'll worsen everything. Exactly, and you'll do it in a reactive fashion. Right, right. So right. once you get that all out, if you have somebody that you trust that knows, underscore, underline, in bold, in, put in bold italics, someone who knows your circumstance... If you take this to someone who doesn't know your circumstance, chances are they're just going to make it worse because they don't understand the context. Somebody has to understand the context of the relationship, how this has been working, and you, they know. So you don't have to convince them that this is happening, right? So if you have somebody like that, let them look at it, get some feedback, you know, ask God to help you, bring you conviction. And then once you get clear about that, then you, and I would also say this, in that, in that, in your confrontation, uh, written, I would always want to include in most situations. And again, because I don't know specifics, but in most situations, I think it's a good idea to say, "Please do not. I do not want to have a conversation about this. Please let. Please write me back. This issue is very, you know, uh, sensitive for me, or intense, or hurtful, or whatever. And so, please let's have this conversation in writing so we can keep the harm down." Because I really want to resolve this. Okay, so you, you want to get that person to respond in writing because you want to force them to go into the same 
and not just come in there and use their verbal skills or whatever to overcome you. Because if they're trying to avoid their responsibility, they're going to use whatever tactics they have. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll take one more break. In reconciliation, sometimes it's healthy to reconcile, but move on. In other words, mm, yeah. With a spouse, you've got to reconcile and live together. Yes. With a friend or an associate, you can reconcile. Right. And it does put, create its own boundary and you move on. In mm -hmm. other words, the relationship does change. Yes. But true reconciliation can take place. True repentance mm -hmm. and conviction can take mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. But the relationship now is on a different plane. It's exactly right. And that's yeah. part of what we have to, that's a good thing to talk about when we come back because, you know, what we sometimes do is we want to have the relationship that we envision right rather than the one that we actually have yeah and, <laughs> and accept that one and move on exactly all right we'll be right back with uh, patrick doyle and veritas counseling and the subject of reconciliation in just a moment hi i'm dan and i work at the dove tv you know compared to portland seattle and la medford might be considered a small market but at The Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community. And you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368. All right, we are dealing with the hot topic of reconciliation. And uh, again, uh, what we're talking about today, this will be up on the Dove website in a day or so, and you can take this YouTube and share it with your friends uh, as a point of discussion. Absolutely. Uh, you might want to take this and use it as a, um, a Bible discussion. Uh, but he brings up four excellent points before true reconciliation can take place. The one who is the offender has to be brought under godly conviction, yep. which would lead to godly repentance, mm -hmm. and then a true confession specifically of what the problem is. Yes. And then ask me for, or ask for forgiveness yes. of, that, of that offense. Right. right. Um, but sometimes in reconciliation, we, we come back, we, we do reconcile and we move on. Mm -hmm. But I've had this happen a lot of times in my life. For whatever reason, I've made mistakes, mm -hmm. offended people, <laughs> vice versa. You but have? The, Shocking. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, the day's not over. In fact, it's just beginning. I'll have time. a couple before five o'clock. But here's the deal. Is that when you have had these offenses, the relationship changes. It, w it doesn't necessarily get back to as if it never happened. No, it never will get back to as if it never happened. And so you, you are changed by it. And mm -hmm. I've learned, all right, I've reconciled. Mm -hmm. I feel clean before the yeah, Lord. Right. I can take communion right. with right. a clean conscience. Right. But my relationship with that person now has changed. Mm -hmm. And it may, as far as I'm concerned, I may not go back to where it was. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Right, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I say this a lot to folks, but you know, we have to live in what is, not what if. But all the time we have, certain, like, do I have certain desires for my children in terms of how my relationship is with them? Do I have dreams about how that looks and how that should be from my perspective? Well, yeah. So if I live in that dream and I avoid the reality that I, of the relationship I have with them, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're, you're at an impasse. Yeah, and so... I mean, I just had one of these moments the other day with my eldest son. He's 18. He's getting ready to graduate high school and all this stuff. And we had this conversation and he was having, telling me stuff. And I was having the revelation as he was talking that my dream is being popped right here. This is not what I want. <laughs> this is not how I want it to go. And I stood there and teared up and said, you know, this, is, uh, this hurts me. I don't want this to be the case. But yet this is reality. I can't. I can't make you be what I want or how I want you to be. And so I had to own that, right? So if you start to live in those relationships for what is, chances are you're going to have some grief, mm. which is what we want to avoid. Mm -hmm. I just want to deny it, rationalize it, and act like it's fine. Mm -hmm. okay? But down the road, that's a terrible plan because it will it'll erode what any relationship you have and so the other thing is is that if i if i look at my say my son for example and i and i keep driving towards the agenda of the relationship i want 
Is that loving? Mm. No, no, selfish versus it selfish. It is. It's, it's, now I've made that relationship yeah. an idol. Mm. And so this is what we do. We make our desired outcome the idol instead of saying, okay, the reality is this person's harming me. Or the reality is I don't like that person. Or whatever. We live in reality and then we start to deal with that. That will move some relationships closer and it'll move some relationships farther away. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have, I have departed ways with people in my life because they just won't repent. And after a while, I just sever the relationship because I, I, I can't do that. And, and here's the other thing I wanted, I wanted to make sure I said today. Look, if someone's offending you, harming you, doing damage, and you let them continue, you aren't loving them. So take it back to the garden. Adam and Eve are in the garden and they have this great relationship with God. They're hanging out with him in the cool of the day, having walks and just it's this beautiful thing. They have this intimacy with him. Well, he said, look, you can do anything in here you want. Just one thing. Don't don't eat of that tree. That's that's just one thing. Okay, just don't do that. All right. Well, you know the story. Mm -hmm. They did that. What did God do after they did that? Did he say, oh, no big deal? No. He went in there and he kicked them out and he posted a gate and an angel with a flaming sword, <laughs> which was a pretty strong sign that says, you ain't getting back in there. It's that ain't this has changed. And it's not going back. Yeah, your actions have changed this and it's not going back. And then he kicks them out and then he consequences them. You're going to f- work and toil and the ground's going to fight you back. You're going to have a more ch- pain in childbirth and you're going to desire your husband and he'll rule over you. <laughs> okay, why did God do that? Was that loving? Well, and yes, in a way it was. It was, of course it was. Yeah. If he just winked at it yeah. and said, no big deal, would that be loving? No. And, but that's what we do all the time. Yeah. And we're doing that with this whole process. We're cut and pasting things. Yes. Uh, uh, I... I you see it more than I do, but it's interesting that people just have a hard time repenting. Yeah. Well, this, and yeah. They may even been under conviction, but pride still holds them from mm-hmm. repenting. Well, it might be a whole other show. probably is, but I think there's a reason why so much of... And I, and I want to talk mostly about the church here because this is what I deal with the most. How do so many people that have been in the church so long never repent? Yeah, why is that? <laughs> well, I think that's a whole show. I, I have some answers for that, but I see it. It's epidemic in its, in its uh, scope. Um, that kind of humility that, that, that honors another human being and recognizes your own sin and, you know, the brokenness of God loving me so undeservedly. I mean, I've not earned or des- do I deserve His love and, and His mercy and how good He's been to me? No, I am absolutely blown out at how good he is and I'm humbled by his absolute care of me okay that creates a softness but we don't see that we see an epidemic of religious veneer we uh, talking about religious veneer boy I hate to do this with only a few moments left but <laughs> well we can just crack the, drop the bomb and run yeah, exactly okay. we'll crack it and run <laughs> I think the church forces when adultery is is the issue yeah I think the church prematurely forces reconciliation. Well, I've seen that a few times. And um, for or the person who's been offended, yeah, uh, feels spiritual pressure. Yes. To reconcile and move on. Right. And I'm going, whoa, time out here. Yeah. Of all the things the Bible allows for divorce, that's yeah. one of them. Yeah. So putting this thing back to prematurely, right. what are you doing here? You know, and I'm not looking for a quick divorce. Don't no, get me wrong. Right. Uh, I think it's the boundary of mm-hmm. things. But on the other hand, you reach these impasses yes. in life, and that's one of them. But I have, you get them, I get them. Yeah. I get the person who's been forced back into a relationship yes. when the whole issue was really not ever dealt with. Exactly. And so it gets back to what I said earlier. I think in many ways in the church, we've created uh, an idol out of marriage. Yeah. So it's not that, I mean, dude, I spend my majority of my life yeah. helping people maintain relationships, marriage relationships. Am I for marriage? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not for bad marriage. Yeah. Okay. Which is, I have to be willing, and this is what I was saying, if somebody's harming you, you have to be willing to let that relationship go. And God, in his mercy and infinite wisdom, made a way for someone who's being harmed, particularly in the way like of uh, adultery, to not continue in that way. If somebody betrays your trust that significantly, mm -hmm. God knew that that is not sometimes recoverable, yeah. which is why he let you out. And one of the first questions I ask people who have been cheated on and they're in my office to reconcile, one of the first questions I ask is, why aren't you taking your out? Mm. And? <laughs> and then you get the answer, well, because my mom or, you know, because the church or because I don't know, I'm afraid or I don't have the money or what about it's going to happen in the future. And all these things, I'm like, yeah, but what about the really? I mean, do you, is this person changed? Do you trust them? Are they repentant? Uh, we don't want to put you back in a situation. And I've seen it, Perry, so many times that. With, yeah, but I've seen infidelity is not instant. Infidelity no. is, happens as a result of a lot of things yes. going bad for a long time. Yes, and that, that's why I'm saying it, this is the this is the pinnacle of a whole mountain of stuff. Right, right. And so that's why I say. Be, so, but they turn it into the, that act. <clears throat> yes, as being the one that needs to be reconciled and right. forgiven with. Right. Nothing that it led up to that. Exactly, and so yeah. that. But that's what I'm saying is if if you and I or in in our, in our marriages if we dealt with our failure as it happened, think about how much peace we would have instead of all the guilt and the shame and the, I mean, and good gracious, when you don't repent, the committee will get a hold of that and just beat you to the ground with it. Mm -hmm. They will remind you and tell you how you should have and yes, what about that? Oh yeah, the committee up here. They will mm -hmm. take your unrepentant sin and drive you into the ground. And hey, when that's happening, that makes you a really good relationship, uh, you know, person that no it when you got all that stuff going on in your head you you can't even be honest with yourself much less a person sitting across the room from you well I've always said when you get into an impasse in relationship whether mm -hmm. it's husband or wife mm -hmm. or just whatever the relationship may be mm -hmm. um, I always say who's going to be the adult mm -hmm. who's going to be the Christian adult yeah. here and right. do the right thing right. and the tough thing right you know yeah but well it's that uh, you get all this stuff you got to wade through all of that you know yeah. but you see here's the thing Perry you know I, I, my, my porn addiction is a good example, is that, you know, I was clearly out of line and no one knew it. My wife never found me out. God convicted me and I came forward. Okay. If God <laughs> convicts you, you'll come forward. This whole idea that we got to go get people and bring them into the relationship is part of the problem. We have to let God do his work, which means I have to live hands off. Yeah, which means I have yeah. to live in what is, which is this relationship isn't where I want it. I want it over here. But God's the only one that can get it there. I right, got a minute. Summarize our day. Uh, if you're in a relationship where you're being harmed, uh, I want you to look at these things. Look at the person that you're that's harming you. Do you see any of the any of the precursors for reconciliation? If you don't draw a boundary, if you don't know how to draw a boundary, find my show on the Dove website on Boundaries mm -hmm. and look at that and, and then you know maybe uh, talk to somebody you know. You have to draw a boundary and you have to start creating a situation that, that, that is painful so the person will either repent or you'll be safe. But either way, you have to do something. You can't just let it go. Conviction, godly conviction, godly repentance, godly confession, godly forgiveness yep. leads to reconciliation. Yep. Thanks. You bet. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> uh, yeah, office number quickly. My office number is 622-6018 or veritascounseling.com. All right. Thank you, bud. You bet. We'll see you next time on Focus Today. Hi, I'm Jim and I work at the Dub TV. Every weekday between 6 and 8 a.m., our award-winning news and sports team bring you the best morning show around. It's live, it's honest, and it's a whole lot of fun. And you help make it happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to air local programs that share your voice by making a secure online donation at our website, thedub.us.